Hi there, Todd Cannell on here. Nice to see you. Hope you're having a good day wherever you are, wherever you're watching from. Uh, it's my pleasure to stand here and open up the scriptures, see if I can uh, find some Jesus in it, and uh, hopefully that uh, makes a difference in your life. Uh, today's sermon is called So Start Living Like It, and it was a lot of fun to write. Hopefully it uh, comes across on screen uh, as it did on the page. This is So Start Living like it. Um, what's the number one complaint you often hear from people about work? Probably doesn't take long to come up with the answer. I hate my boss. Uh, a boss is kind of like love handles or earwax. Uh, it's always there and it is always annoying. I know because I am one. I am a boss. I have employees. In fact, my whole life I have um, worked for myself with you know, the small exception of being a youth pastor for a few years, that's really the only time in my life when I've had a boss, uh, a direct overseer. Um, I am not a guy who uh, takes well to being under someone else's authority. Therefore, I am the case in point for today's sermon. Therefore, this message is ultimately for me. But it might also be for you because you, like me, might hate being under someone else's authority. That's really why we have an aversion to bosses, because they are in charge, uh, and we hate having someone in charge over us. Um, this is true when it comes to Christianity. Many people love many of the teachings of Christianity. They just don't want to submit to its teacher. Last night I was on a uh, television program. Uh, the topic was about angels in the afterlife, and uh, I was brought in to be part of the panel, kind of as the token Christian. They didn't really say that I was the token Christian, but I was the only Christian on a panel of eight, so you do the math and tell me whether or not I was the token Christian. I've done this a few times throughout my life where I've been invited to be part of uh, a broadcast environment, kind of representing uh, Christians and hopefully representing Jesus. It's a stressful thing because I want to, in and of myself, um, stand up for what I believe to be true. At the same time, I've seen enough strident Christians on television uh, to know that we can often come across as uh, offensive, mean, uh, arrogant, superior, you know, you name it. And I certainly didn't want to come across that way. So it's a weird tension. You're trying to uh, stand up for what's right uh, while at the same time being the nicest version of yourself. It was pretty interesting. I was uh, seated between uh, two very pluralistic women uh, right across the table from a strident atheist from the University of Toronto, face-to-face uh, -face with an oracle who, uh, you know, basically does medium work. Uh, it was a very interesting table to uh, sit at. What's interesting is the one pluralist lady on my left, she's a palliative care specialist, and throughout the course of the conversation, several times she referred to, you know, wanting to be a good person, uh, about the imperative of serving others, especially that second one uh, is drawn right out of the Christian scriptures. Uh, the oracle medium lady uh, sitting right across from me, Right at the end of the program, she began extolling the virtues of the golden rule, uh, doing unto others as you would have others do unto you, uh, as really kind of the highest ideal of a right spiritual practice. And uh, what I wanted to say was, right, the golden rule from the Bible. You just don't want to live what the Bible teaches. You want to cherry pick what the Bible teaches whenever it happens to suit you. And she's by no means the exception. Um, almost everybody I know does this uh, to one degree or another. And I know that in me, even in terms of my preference for um, certain types of theology, certain uh, approaches when it comes to understanding and walking out uh, the specifics, the niceties of Christian doctrine, I'm aware that I also have a bias, and that comes from my worldview, it comes from my life experience. Uh, and so I think all of us, to some degree, have a tendency to cherry pick uh, from the scripture. But this is really a problem with people who don't acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus and yet want to um, enjoy the benefits, if you will, of his teachings without having to sit under his authority. I want to say in this environment, because this is my environment, I want to say that without Jesus' authority, there is no Christianity. So if you think you're a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, and you are not somebody who lives under the authority of Jesus on an ongoing basis, you're a counterfeit, you're a fake, you're a fraud. Okay, and uh, that we find some evidence for uh, this in Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, which is our text today. I'm reading as I always do out of the New King James Version. Then they went into Capernaum, 
And immediately on the Sabbath, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And when the unclean, unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then all were amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Verse 28, And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. So, last week's sermon, um, Jesus ends up calling his first four disciples. Uh, he's wandering by the Sea of Galilee. He calls his first four disciples. They follow him, and then, boom, we're into the next sequence. Uh, if you're just joining me today for the first time, I'm preaching through the entire book of Mark over the next, well, now it's uh, 64 weeks. This entire series is going to take us 67 weeks, week after week, going through the entire Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's going to take us right until the middle of May 2015. So if you missed uh, the last two sermons, just pop on to ToddCandelon.com. You'll find the links there to the sermons. Um, it'll take you right to YouTube and you can uh, catch up. But I've mentioned in each of the previous sermons that um, Mark's Gospel has almost a, a cinematic feel to it. He tends to jump from scene to scene, from moment to moment. Uh, he tends to ellipse time. This is what we do in screenwriting, uh, where we write one scene and then immediately transition to a new scene. And that scene might be ten years later. Uh, in Mark's Gospel, it's never ten years later, but um, there can be the passage of time uh, between these scenes in Mark. And uh, the way in which he structures his book uh, makes it really fun to read, because it doesn't really ever let up. The pace keeps going and going and going and going. Uh, look with me at verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. So the narrative drive, I just finished saying, continues. It doesn't let up. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Um, this is a recurring theme in Mark. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. The story keeps moving. Uh, your life keeps moving. If you feel like you're on a bit of a treadmill, this is totally normative. It's great that we see the life of Jesus in this kind of context, a life in motion, a life of, of, of constant activity, a life of service, a life of ministry. Um, there's a story to tell. This is the idea here in Mark. This story is important. This story matters. Let's get to the story. Let's cut to the chase. We need to remember that there is a story to tell with our lives as well. We need to cut to the chase. Many of us waste our lives. We waste a lot of time. Um, we don't do enough. Now, I'm not suggesting a works righteousness kind of approach here. I'm not suggesting that you earn God's friendship by how hard you work. But I am suggesting that in light of all that God is and all that God has done for us in Christ, um, we ought to spend our lives achieving something. We ought to spend our lives doing something. We ought to spend our lives moving rapidly from scene to scene to scene for the sake of Jesus Fame. Don't forget that you have a story to tell. Don't forget that you are meant to be a storyteller. So Jesus goes to Capernaum. Uh, this is his home base during his Galilean ministry. I've been there. I grew up in, in Israel, and uh, we used to go up to the Sea of Galilee uh, on weekends just to hang out. It's kind of the, it's the only freshwater lake in the whole country. It's a nice place to go, especially in the summer when it's really hot outside. And uh, we would often take um, groups of visitors up to Capernaum to see it. It's on the northwest side of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's a ruin. And what's really interesting is you can still go to uh, the remains of the synagogue in Capernaum. Now we're not sure that the remains that are actually there were the remains of the synagogue that was there in Jesus' time, but um, most scholars are pretty sure that the floor, there's a beautiful um, mosaic floor in the ruins that are there today, they're quite sure that that mosaic floor would have been the mosaic floor in the synagogue that Jesus uh, was teaching in in this scene here in the book of Mark. It's pretty cool. I remember as a boy standing there on the, uh, on the floor thinking, because I knew the story, thinking that Jesus would have stood here and preached. It's uh, pretty cool. So he goes to Capernaum. This is his home base uh, while he ministers in the north of Israel. And it's a Saturday, so he goes into the synagogue and he preaches. Um, Jesus goes to church. Yes, I know it's not church, it's synagogue, but most of my viewers aren't Jews, most of my viewers are Christians. Uh, we're not Jews, we don't go to synagogue on Saturday, we're Christians, we go to church on Sunday. So I'm going to exchange the one, synagogue on Saturday, for the other, church on Sunday. Jesus goes to church and he preaches. Um, 
it's important for us as Christians to remember to go to church. Remember not to stop going to church as has become the habit of some. That's my paraphrase of uh, Hebrews 10, verse 25. i got to just pause here for a second and say it seems to me like this is a big issue. Uh, a friend of mine works in the uh, sound and uh, projection business. And for many years, uh, the company that he works in, it, it was his um, wife's father's company. And uh, so it's a family business, and they've been in business for a long, long time. And principally, for many, many years, their business was supplying sound and lighting and projection for churches. And he mentioned, I saw him last week, he mentioned how they were looking over their records, kind of tracking how the business is doing, uh, what trends they can identify. And uh, he said just in terms of the stats that they see, and also anecdotally, it seems to him like churches are in decline. Uh, orders are down. Uh, the bulk of their business is no longer in churches. And he said, it seems like every church I go into is dead or dying. Um, you may know this to be true anecdotally from your context. Uh, it's, it's rare to go into a church that's really thriving, that really has a sense of life and vitality about it. Now, yes, there are exceptions. Uh, in every city, uh, I think you'll find a few churches that are um, still a cause celeb, a, a going concern. But for the most part, um, most churches are in decline and or dying. This is universally true, especially in North America. Um, many people just don't go to church anymore. Um, it's funny, neighbors of ours, we uh, they're Christians, they're believers, they're followers of Jesus. And uh, we were talking about church attendance in the summer and how hard it is for them to uh, find time to go to church in the summer because there's so many other things to do in the summer. Uh, this might be true for you. It's hard for me. Um, this past summer was the first summer where I wasn't actively pastoring a church. And there were many Sundays where it was much easier for me to just um, go to the lake, hang out with my kids, then drag our butts to church. Um, this is not okay. It's not okay for us to stop going to church. The Bible itself reminds us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as has become the habit of some. That's the actual quote from Hebrews 10.25. Um, why go to church? There's lots of reasons. Here in this text, we find a simple one. I'm not going to talk about the other reasons because they're not in the text. In this text, a good reason to go to church is because Jesus went to church. It's Saturday. He goes to synagogue. Okay, this is what he would have done. He was a Jew. They were in the habit of going to synagogue on Saturday. As Christians, we should be in the habit of going to church on Sunday. Uh, why go to church? Because Jesus did. Also, um, go to church because there's preaching there. <laughs> I like this part because I'm a preacher. Verse 22, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. It's a great day to be a preacher when you get to this text. It's a great text for preachers. Um, Jesus is at church. He's at synagogue. He's at church, and he preaches. Um, now, how would that have happened uh, in a Jewish synagogue? Typically, they would be working their way through pass passages from the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, number, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and um, they would read the passage, and they would also sometimes work through the prophets, the Psalms, depending uh, on the time of year, depending on the synagogue, but they would read a passage from the Bible, and then the preacher, the teacher, would expound upon it. So that is the first model we see for preaching. You open the Bible, and you teach from it. Uh, there are some churches in which this is still the pattern. You open the Bible and you teach from it. Um, there are some churches in which that's not really the pattern. Um, in some churches, the pastor comes up with a theme, a topic, an idea, um, a series of points, and then stitches those ideas, those points uh, together, um, connecting them to various passages uh, in Scripture. I'm not saying that's an altogether um, bankrupt way of um, spending your pulpit time in church. But I don't think that's the biblical model for preaching. I think the biblical model for preaching is to open the Scriptures, read a passage, and preach from it. Obviously, I think that's the way to do it, because that's how I do it. But um, I do it that way, one, because that's how my dad taught me, uh, because that's how his dad taught him, because that's how his dad taught him, and that's how his dad taught him. But also, we preach that way because we think it's the right way to preach. Open the Scriptures and teach from it. And then it gets really interesting in verse 22. And they were astonished. That's the gold standard for preaching right there. Preaching should be astonishing. All right, for me, my whole life, I've been preaching full-time since I was 19 years of age. When I sit down with a passage of Scripture, I am looking to blow people's minds. Now, I understand that that doesn't happen just because of me. 
It's not because of my ability or my education or my history or my training or my background that I can blow minds. Ultimately, in preaching, uh, people's minds are blown as the Holy Spirit brings the content to life. The preacher is preaching something. The person listening feels like the preacher is reading their mail because it fits exactly with where they're at in their life right now. That's not the preacher's doing. That's the Holy Spirit's doing as the Holy Spirit indwells faithful preaching from the Bible about Jesus. But as a preacher... That should be your goal. You are looking to blow minds. Preaching should be astonishing. So if the preaching in your church is meh, right? How often have you sat through a sermon that's kind of like meh, right? You could go to sleep. You wouldn't really miss anything. If that's you, if that's your church, let me encourage you to send your pastor a note. It could read something like this, quote, um, Dear Pastor Bob, I was reminded this week from Mark chapter 1, verse 22, that preaching is supposed to be astonishing. Please take this as an invitation to blow our minds, end quote. Sincerely yours, Steve. As long as you write it like that, no pastor is going to be offended, okay? Many pastors are afraid of offending you. Many pastors are afraid of preaching too strong. They're afraid of scaring people off. They're afraid of driving people away. And if that has been their habit for many years, many of them will have lost the astonishing aspect of preaching. Uh, and it's very clear from Scripture that preaching should be and must be astonishing. So if your church is meh, write your pastor a kind and friendly note inviting him to rediscover the astonishment in his preaching. Uh, if you're a preacher listening to this, rise to the challenge, man. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, uh, what do you mean exactly by astonishing? Uh, we'll find that in verse 22. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Um, so we see here clearly that preaching rises to the level of astonishing when one, it's from the Bible, two, it's Jesus focused, three, it's authoritative. I'll say it again. Preaches ri preaching rises to the level of astonishing when it's from the Bible, it's Jesus focused, and it is authoritative. Why would I say these three things? Well, one, Jesus is preaching from the Bible, so so should we. Simple. Two, the sermon was by Jesus, about Jesus, so you should preach about Jesus. All right, another time when he stands up in Nazareth and preaches from the scriptures, he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's preaching, about a, he's preaching from a messianic prophetic passage, and he basically says, I'm the dude, I'm he. This is all about me. Um, so Jesus is preaching about himself, so you should preach about Jesus. So preaching should be about Jesus. It should be from the Bible. It should be Jesus-focused, and the sermon should be authoritative. Jesus preached with authority. What does it mean to preach with authority? It means to come to the Scripture, to keep it about Jesus, and to say, look, this is what this means, and this is what that means for you. It's uh, downright offensive in our day and age when the last thing any of us want to do is tell people what they should believe. Not so the Christian, because the Christian lives under authority. Okay, if you're a Christian, you are not the highest authority in your life. God is. Okay, Jesus, God the Son, is. The Bible, as God's spoken or revealed word about himself and his people, is. Okay, you are not the final authority in your life. God is. So to preach with authority means to say, look, this is what this means. This is what that means for you, if you are a Christian who's operating from a biblical worldview, there's a very good chance, and I'm being nice, okay, I could say this much more aggressively, but I'm trying to be friendly here. If you're a Christian who's operating from a biblical worldview, there's a very good chance that you need to take the Bible more seriously. All right, I'll say it again. If you are a Christian who's operating from a biblical worldview, there's a very good chance that you need to take the Bible more seriously. Now, if you're not a Christian who's operating from a biblical worldview, Click away from this site. Like, we got nothing to say to each other. Like, there's just no common ground. Okay, if you think the Bible is a series of, you know, wisdom stories that you can pick and choose from as you please to suit your particular worldview, we're not vibing right now. We're, we're on a different, you're on a different planet from me. Okay, I am a Christian, Jesus-loving Bible preacher. Okay, I am someone who is seeking to learn to live under the authority of the Scriptures. Let me say I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect. I don't always get it right. But that's the driving force in my life. I am someone who has ordered his life based on my best understanding, which is an evolving understanding, of who Jesus is 
and what that means for me and what that means in terms of how I am to treat others. So if you, like me, are living according to a biblical worldview, there's a very good chance that you, like me, need to take the Bible more seriously. How do you do this? You read it for yourself. Okay, it's amazing to me the level of biblical ignorance that exists among Christians. It's crazy. Uh, it comes up most of the time when I'll get an email from someone or a phone call from someone or I'll meet with someone personally and there's an issue. They think I'm off, to, you know, I'm off in left field because of something I've said. I'm out to lunch because of something I didn't say. Uh, and they think, the Bible says this. Like, really? Uh, okay, where? Oftentimes they don't know where. Uh, okay, let's go there and look at it. Oftentimes they're misinterpreting it. Um, sometimes I am the one who's misinterpreting it, but let me tell you as a preacher, I work very hard to make sure I'm not misinterpreting it because one, I'm afraid of God. Two, I'm not interested in conflict. So I'd rather do my homework up front so that by the time I put this out there into the world, I can be confident that what I'm saying is true. Okay, the level of biblical ignorance is just astonishing. So if you have stopped reading the Bible, and you're a Christian who's seeking to live with the Bible as your worldview, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Okay, if you're falling into error, if you're falling into sin, if you're falling into worldliness, if you're losing your joy, just, just revisit the Bible. Are you reading your word? Are you in the Bible on a regular basis? Don't come back at me with like, oh, you're teaching legalism, Todd. What do you mean we have to read... It is the inspired living word of God, from God, about God and His people. Okay, if you're seeking to live in relationship with God, why wouldn't you spend time in the document that the Christians have agreed is, is the basis for knowing and understanding God? It, it's silly. So if, if you're that kind of Christian, uh, stop it and uh, get back to your Bible. Also, make sure you are attending a church where the pastor preaches from the Bible about Jesus. Okay? If your pastor doesn't preach from the Bible about Jesus, you should find another church. Okay? If, you, if you go weeks without hearing about Jesus, if you go weeks without exploring uh, a significant passage of Scripture, uh, if you go months without hearing about the core teachings of Jesus and without hearing how that ought to be changing your life radically, you're in the wrong place. Okay? If you're looking to be a Christian who lives with uh, the Bible as uh, the dominant factor in their worldview. If you're not, you're, you're, you're not a Christian. Okay? If the Bible for you isn't the defining factor in how you see the world, you, you, simply put, you're not a Christian. You, you might be a syncretist, you might be a pluralist, you, know, you might be a pseudo-Christian. You're not a real Christian unless the Bible is the dominant factor in uh, your worldview. Okay? Just simple. So uh, if you're not reading your Bible, if you're not attending a church where the Bible is preached about Jesus, you need to make some changes. Um, and if that's you, it's no wonder that nobody is responding to your life. Like, Todd, I haven't seen anybody come to Jesus in years. Uh, you know, our church services are just boring. That's why! Okay? That's why! If you're not seeing life transformation in your peers, in your life, in your family's life, in your friend's life, you've probably lost much of the vim and vigor that you ought to have as someone who is following Jesus, okay? A church service without Jesus is just a total waste of time. No Bible, no Jesus, no authority equals no astonishment. All right, I'll say it again. No Bible, no Jesus, no authority equals no astonishment. You know what most people think about Christianity? Really? This is what most people think about Christianity. Meh. And we are to blame. If we don't right this ship, we're in big trouble because there is darkness all around us. Let's look at verses 23 and 24. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. <laughs> I love this. There's a demon possessed guy at church. <laughs> yes, I know, he's at synagogue. I told you earlier that I'm substituting the two. There is a demon-possessed guy in church. Now, you may think you've met some weird characters in church. That's right. <laughs> so I'm just saying, I'm getting flashbacks of all the extremely weird people I have met in my years as a pastor. Um, it's just a law of the universe that the freaks 
come to church. Just how it is. Every church I've pastored has some very strange people in it. Every church I was in as a boy where my dad was a pastor has some very weird people in it. Um, let's just get it on the table, okay? Churches are messed up places because they're full of people, and people are universally messed up. All right, the next time someone criticizes Christianity because they think churches are all baked, ask them about the corporate culture where they work. Say, how, how functional is the corporate culture where you work? Right? <laughs> Guaranteed, it's highly dysfunctional. Why? Well, because the corporate culture is full of people, and people are universally messed up. Point them to politics. Right? I live in the greater Toronto area. <laughs> Two words, Rob Ford. Right? Why is the city of Toronto's politics so messed up? Well, because politics involves politicians, and politicians are people, and people are universally messed up. If I've ever done something that has offended you, why are you shocked? I'm a person, and people are universally messed up. Next time you do something where you mess up, don't uh, cover up for yourself. Don't deny it. Admit it. Say, my bad, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. It's my mistake. Please accept my apology. I'm a person and, and people are universally messed up. Um, we need to remember to embrace the messiness of church. This has been hard for me as a pastor. I, I want to um, control the messiness of church. I get uncomfortable when uh, the weird people come out to play. Not because I don't like weird people, because everyone's weird. I'm weird in some ways. But um, I'm worried about the other people in the church, you know, where the weird tambourine lady is over there, you know, dancing with Jesus. Uh, I'm worried about what the other people will think, and I don't want them to get turned off. So it, it's not like I'm trying to be mean or trying to discriminate against her. But um, I'm just saying that I, I need to learn to embrace this point. I need to learn to embrace the messiness of church. If everyone at your church looks perfect, um, they're just perfect liars, um, and something is wrong. So just check your church, and uh, if it's not full of messy people, um, start building relationship and uh, get down to the realness with as many people as possible. And uh, as soon as you do, you'll begin to um, lose that sense of veneer, that sense of perfection that so many of us um, put up around ourselves like a defense. Jesus gets up to preach, and demon guy freaks out. <laughs> Verse 24, ah, let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? You came to destroy us. I know who you are, the Holy One of God, right? It's, this is a scene. Jesus is preaching and boom, demon guy jumps up and starts freaking out. Um, what does Jesus do? Verse 25, shut up and leave him alone. Shut up and leave him alone. Boom. Just like that, the demon convulses the guy, shrieks, and leaves. Then we get to verse 27. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Three things here. Jesus is amazing. They were all amazed. Jesus is amazing. Jesus taught a new way. What is this? What new doctrine is this? Jesus taught a new way. Jesus has authority, for with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So if you are looking to pattern your life and ministry on Jesus, which you should be, because Christian means little Christ, then here's how you must live. You must live, one, like Jesus is amazing. Okay, everything in your life should reek of and shine like Jesus is the best and Jesus is enough and Jesus is amazing. Okay, I was tempted to go out. It's a silly, silly example. I was tempted to go out and buy a 60-inch flat screen TV for my 40th birthday. Why? Because I want a bigger TV. Why didn't I? Because Jesus is amazing. Okay, and Jesus is enough. <coughs> and if Jesus is enough, then my 40-incher is enough also. Okay, I mean it. I didn't go out and buy a new television because Jesus is amazing. If you're not living like that, if you're not living like Jesus is amazing, like Jesus is enough, then you're falling short. Okay, two, in light of this, you must live like Jesus is cutting edge. Jesus is ultimately relevant. I know those are dirty words. I know we think that those words have been overused and overplayed. 
But it's simply clear here that newness is key. What is this new doctrine this guy's teaching? Each new day, each new cultural trend, each new season in your life should be radically seasoned with and steeped in the greatness of Jesus. Okay, hear me on this. The greatness of Jesus should never lose its luster in your life. Jesus never goes out of style. It's our hearts that get calloused. Okay, hear me. Jesus never goes out of style. It's our hearts that get calloused. It's our eyes that grow dim. It's our ears that become deafened. Okay, there's no problem with Jesus. There's a problem with you. There's a problem with me. If Jesus is no longer interesting to you, then you don't know Jesus. The third thing, in light of this, you must live like Jesus is in authority over you. So, when you're facing a decision, why should I do this? Because of who Jesus is, because of what Jesus did, and because of what that means for me. Why shouldn't I do this? Same answer. Because of who Jesus is, because of what Jesus did, and because of what that means for me. Okay, everything in life comes back to the answer to these questions. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God the Son made flesh. Okay, who is Jesus? He's God the Son made flesh. This has some pretty powerful presuppositions packed into it. That God exists, okay, that he became a man, that he actually entered into space-time history, lived on the earth fully God and fully man, God in a body, the God-man, okay? Jesus is God the Son, okay? What did Jesus do? He became flesh. He lived, died, rose again for us and for our salvation, to deal with our sin, to restore us to relationship with the Holy God, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. What does that mean for me? Well, if all of the above is true, if Jesus is who He said He was, if Jesus did what the Bible said He did, um, this is what that means for me. Nothing can ever be the same again. Okay, if the story about Jesus is true, nothing can ever be the same again. You can't cheat on your taxes because Jesus is Lord. All right, you can't sleep with your girlfriend because Jesus is Lord. You don't lose hope because Jesus is Lord. We don't apologize for the imperative demands of Scripture because Jesus is Lord. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. And on. Maybe I will. You love your wife because Jesus is Lord. You father your kids, even if it's hard for you like it is for me, because Jesus is Lord. You repent of sin, because you'll keep committing sin. I do. You repent of sin because Jesus is Lord. You do your best because Jesus is Lord. You have fun, and I do. I have lots of fun, especially in the summer. It can't come quick enough. I have fun because Jesus is Lord. You're kind because Jesus is Lord. You live like a free man or a free woman. Why? Because Jesus is Lord, and it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You read your Bible. You learn to worship. You give generously. You serve others. You remember the poor. You take care of widows and orphans in their distress. You attend church. You love your neighbors. You keep your head up because Jesus is Lord. You start living like that, word's going to get around. And that's what happened in verse 28. And immediately, his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Don't miss that. Jesus' fame spread because he was in authority. So start living like it. 